Hello everyone, once again, welcome to the 16th Virtual International Day of Myth Life on May 5th, 2024. This is session 18, Multibustion and Hypnobirthing Integrative Therapies to Consider. In this session, we will have Cindy Farley, CNM, PhD, FA, CNM as the moderator. And Dr. Farley is a professor emerita at Georgetown University in the Nurse Midwifery Women's Health Nurse Practitioner Program. We will also have to distinguish speakers, Joe Lutterman, a doctor in nursing prestige student at Georgetown University who will be sharing about multibustion, and Emily Western, a doctor in nurse prestige student at Georgetown University who will also share about hypnobirthing. Without further ado, let's welcome our moderator and distinguished speakers. Please share virtual emoticon to greet our moderators and speakers. And I'll hand over to Dr. Farley. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Allie and Kananthi, for the introduction and for your facilitation of our talk. I have been moderating the Georgetown VIDM Student Cafe for nine years now, and I would like to give tribute to Lorraine Mockford, who passed away recently. She was my facilitator uh, throughout my time with VIDM, and I always looked forward to working with her she was so positive and supportive of our Georgetown students. I called her a, an honorary midwife. I give no higher praise. Rest in peace to Lorraine. Next slide, please. I do write and edit two textbooks, both of which describe the use of integrative therapies in midwifery care. And I do see Nell Tharp in the audience uh, lead editor on the CPG book. Next slide, please. As Kananthi said, I am Cindy Farley. I'm Professor Emerita at Georgetown University in their midwifery and women's health nurse practitioner programs. I do live in a small village in the Midwest area of the United States, and I've been a midwife for over 40 years. In my teaching, I encourage students to explore the evidence and use of integrative therapies. Joe Leatherman and Emily Western did such an excellent job with their class presentations that we wanted to share their information to our global audience. Next slide, please. Sustaining midwifery mastery of alternative and complementary therapies that integrate with standard midwifery care provides options to our patients. Integrative therapies offer a more holistic approach to healthcare that provides, um, that combines rather techniques from several disciplines to be used in lieu of or in conjunction with standard treatments. And this all depends on patient conditions and patient preferences. Integrative therapies often use renewable resources such as plant-based remedies and compassionate personnel, and they use very little in the way of single-use disposable equipment. Because many integrative therapies are easily accessible and not typically mediated through medical and healthcare financial systems, they are within the reach of many individuals. To sustain midwifery hallmarks of care, such as person-centered care and individual autonomy, midwives are called to be aware of and open to a variety of integrative practices and the scientific evidence and cultural traditions for their use. These options for care can then be discussed and facilitated when patient conditions and patient choice align. Next slide, please. I do want to take a moment to share some of the topics that our students have uh, addressed over the last eight years. And I want to say Hoya Saxa to our Georgetown students and alumni. Hoya Saxa is a phrase in Latin meaning what rocks. And I would say on this day, midwives all around the world rock. Next slide, please. Use of alternative and complementary therapies is very common. It is estimated that at least one third of childbearing individuals use such therapies 
and about half do not disclose this information to their healthcare providers. Many of these practices have not been studied in a formal scientific manner. As midwives, we can have respectful discussions around such therapies by following the four Ps listed on the slide. The first is protect. Are there known or potential harms associated with this practice? Second is permit, support the use of practices that have no evidence of harm. The third is promote, let's encourage the use of practices with known benefits, such as moxibustion and hypnobirthing. And fourth is partnership, always respect the person's right to self-determination. I will now hand over our presentation to Dr. Joe Leatherman, Happy International Day of the Midwife, and next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Leatherman. I am very happy to share that I recently completed my degree requirements for my Doctor of Nursing practice in women's health and midwifery, and I get to graduate in just a few short days on May 17th, so very excited. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I currently serve on a few boards in my community, but I am very excited that I will soon get to serve my community in a new way as a midwife. I also consider myself to be quite the motivated change agent, and therefore I really do aspire to get deeply involved with policy and be a part of the change that I hope to see as it relates to improving maternal health outcomes for the birthing people in my country, especially birthing people of color. Additionally, as a self-proclaimed change agent, I find joy in exploring evidence-based techniques that protect the beauty and sacred nature of physiologic birth. So therefore today, I really would like to talk to all of you about an alternative therapy to consider, which is moxibustion as a solution for breech presentations. So next slide, please. All right, just curious, how many of you have actually heard of moxibustion before? So we're gonna use the chat box here. I simply want you to put a number one in the chat if you've never heard of moxibustion before, a two in the chat if you've heard of it before, and then three if you've recommended this to patients or clients of your own. And I'll give it just a second. Oh, awesome. I saw a three pop up there. Awesome. All right. Great. So I'll give you a little bit of overview on the topic. Moxibustion is a form of traditional Chinese medicine that has historical roots. The practice of moxibustion requires burning of the moxa or mugwort, which is often seen as a roll of herbs and is said to have over 60 ingredients. A 2013 Chinese review examined more than 50 years of literature on moxibustion used in China, which showed that fetal malpresentation was the most common indication above all 300 plus conditions that this technique could be used for. Now, there are three different types of moxibustion. Direct, which is when the moxa fiber is applied directly to the skin. Indirect, which uses a barrier between the skin and the moxa, like a slice of ginger or garlic or just distance. And then there's the warm needle technique, which is when moxa is burned on the handle of an acupuncture needle at an acupuncture point. Additionally, there is a smokeless and smoke moxa. So smokeless moxa is manufactured by removing the combustible organic compound from the herb. So as you can imagine, the infrared radiation intensity produced by traditional smoke moxa is much more potent and has a much larger thermal effect than the smokeless moxa does. I would like to mention for a second that moxibustion can be used with or without pressure at the BL67 point, which I put here on the slide for you. But for the purposes of this presentation, please be aware that when I am referring to moxibustion, it is with pressure at the BL67 point, which is most common. 
Now, how does waving this little smoke stick full of herbs by the pinky toe actually work? That is a great question. Many theories have arisen regarding the mechanism of action for moxibustion, including that the moxa promotes uterine contractility with resultant fetal movement, causing the breech fetus to turn cephalic. However, the original Chinese medicine belief is that a malpresentation of the fetus occurs when the pregnant person has an imbalance of yin and yang. Moxibustion is believed to restore this balance through a sort of thermal energy using the BL67 point that is said to be a transition point between yin and yang vital energies and a major pressure point that affects the uterus. Next slide, please. So the beautiful thing about this conference and the International Day of the Midwife as a whole is that we get to gather as midwives from all over the world. And so we get to hear about different standards of care for different variations in pregnancy and birth. So I do want to take a minute here to discuss the current standard of practice in the United States for correcting breach presentations. And feel free at any point to share in the chat what you see most used in practice where you are in the world. So external... External cephalic version, or ECV, is a procedure that has been studied for a long time, and it is regarded as a method of clinically and statistically reduced breach presentations and reduced cesarean sections. The image on the slide here kind of gives a snapshot of what the procedure is like. Um, this technique is used often here in the United States, and it is most often done with ultrasound guidance and fetal monitoring. We can go to the next slide. Now here, I want to take a look at a side-by-side -side view of external cephalic version and moxibustion. According to the literature, ECV is successful for about 58% of breech presentations. And of this 58% of fetuses that are converted to cephalic, about 80% of the individuals carrying this baby will give birth vaginally. Additionally, the likelihood that the fetus will revert to breach after an ECV is approximately 3% or so. Moxibustion is considered a non-invasive, cost-effective technique that, when taught, can be self-administered by a person and requires no medical intervention, but is equally, if not more effective, in converting a breach presentation as is an ECV. In the three pieces of literature that I retain for my review, which I will go over in just a moment, you can see that the success rates were from 60 to 82% from the results of the studies, which is pretty impressive. I will not go through all of the sections of this chart individually, but I do want to highlight the contraindication section. Please note that a contraindication to one is a contraindication to another. Thus, if an individual cannot get an ECV, they will also be prohibited from trying moxibustion. And since I mentioned the literature review, I will go ahead and dive into that section so that we can all better understand the context of the interventions performed to get the results that I displayed in this chart. So next slide, please. Um, the three articles in my literature review consisted of an observational case series, a randomized control trial, and a quasi-experimental design. We can go to the next slide. I will be providing some background on each of the studies, and you can see the results here displayed in the chart next to each reference. The first study was observed in Italy at a public gynecology clinic. The author ended up with a sample of 93 women. The women in the study were actually taught to self-administer moxibustion, and they were specifically instructed to lysopine, with the knees and hips flexed with a pillow under the sacral region to perform this. Treatment required heat at the BL67 point bilaterally for 15 to 20 minutes daily for two weeks. And if there was persistent abnormal presentation at the end of the second week, then they would be asked to do both the BL67 and the SI1 point. So the SI1 point is right at the edge of the pinky nail on your hand for a duration of about 30 minutes for three times in one week. The SI1 point, according to Master Jeffrey Wynn, who is mentioned in this article, is a point aimed at the umbilical cord, which the Chinese gynecology school believes is partially responsible for non-cephalic presentations despite treatment at the BL67. 
if acupuncture needles were desired to be used, then a single experienced acupuncturist would need to be involved with that client. The outcome was evaluated via phone by contacting women after their births to determine what their outcomes were. Um, the second study, the author of this randomized control trial gathered a sample of 138 pregnant women, so 69 in each group, from six healthcare centers affiliated to medical universities in an urban area in Iran. The women in the group were 18 and older, nulliparous or multiparatus, with a history of natural childbirth, 32 to 35 weeks gestation, ultrasound confirmed breach, with a singleton pregnancy, and no contraindications to vaginal birth and no obstetrical problems. The intervention was self-taught acupressure by a qualified and certified researcher. Participants were asked to put a certain amount of pressure on the BL67 in a comfortable position at home, so any position that they felt was comfortable, after a meal each day for two weeks total. The sequence would last for 10 minutes, alternating between pressure for 10 seconds and rest for two seconds on both feet simultaneously. The control group only received routine care. And then moving on to the final reference, lastly, the author of this three-arm pilot trial gathered a sample of 60 women that fit the following profile. So singleton breach between 33 and 35 weeks gestation, diagnosed by physical exam or ultrasound, 18 years and older, normal fetal biometry, and normal pregnancy progression. The intervention consisted of stimulating the BL67 point using either smokeless or smoke moxibustion for 20 minutes, once or twice daily for 10 to 14 days, after which the outcome would be measured by ultrasound. And the control group in this study received just routine care as well. We can move on to the next slide. So in the United States, equitable care has been a long time challenge. And so I find that it is very important to take a moment to consider the role of social determinants of health in providing any form of care. So we will chat about that briefly and how it applies here by moving from left to right on the screen. Education, access, and quality. Unfortunately, in a lot of places here, it is not uncommon to have very short visits, so 10, 15 minutes, and sometimes clients just do not get the education that they need in that short period of time. It's hard to cover everything. Um, so discussion of any technique or procedure and all of its alternatives is very important and a vital part of shared decision making, so you need the time to cover these things. In doing this, you have to speak on a level that the client can understand and be aware of any learning barriers or preferences. This category also applies to healthcare providers because there is a big gap in education when it comes to the use of alternative therapies, such as moxibustion, which the literature has demonstrated is effective for this indication. But if providers don't know enough about something to be comfortable with its use, then often they're not going to refer it to clients. Um, healthcare and quality ties into neighborhood and environment. What do you have access to where you live? If Even if there is a healthcare provider that can support the use of moxibustion, do they have a certified acupuncturist if you need it that they can refer you to? And that is also kind of a segue into economic stability because if there is a referral, can you afford the service? Um, the literature is saying that it's very cost effective, but I have not pinpointed exactly how much um, countrywide, the average cost is for an acupuncturist service. And any added expense whenever you're expecting a new baby can feel like a lot. You're buying things for the nursery, you're buying things to take care of yourself postpartum, you're buying new things for the baby. And so adding on an expense in your prenatal care can seem like a bit much at times. Lastly, are you in a social or community environment that promotes alternative therapies? Do you have someone at home to help you if you're self-administering? So, so many of these things play a big part in a person's ability to be able to have access to all of the options that are available to them in pregnancy and childbirth. So it's something that we as midwives should consider when um, recommending. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so finally, I would like to discuss, speaking of the midwife, what is the role of the midwife in all of this? So you can follow me from left to right on this slide as well. We have a duty here to learn more. We have got to stay in tune with the evidence, especially 
The longer we are out of school and in the workforce, it is easy to fall into a routine of how things have always been done. But we need to be able to continue to learn more about the different options that we can provide to birthing people. If you have access to platforms like Evidence-Based Birth and Cochrane Review, these are wonderful places to learn about the state of the science on many issues. It's good to have resources. So a big part of our job is being able to connect birthing people with the tools that they need to optimize wellness during pregnancy for better childbirth outcomes. So start a resource folder or a book or a document inside of an electronic device where you can easily find contact information for people in your area or near your area that can provide specialized services such as this one. And we should always consult when necessary. One of the studies did mention how it would be appropriate to notify the consulting physician early on in an effort to prepare them for a possible needed ECV or C-section. And in some cases, the pediatrician may want to know if moxibustion was used, though there has been no evidence that it causes any harm to the fetus. And as midwives, our superpower is education. So teach them what we know. And this will empower them to take charge of their care. Uh, this information today may be new to many of you. So now you have something new to teach to your clients in terms of options for correcting bridge presentations. And lastly, we should provide reassurance and anticipatory guidance. Sometimes these things are unpredictable, right? But being able to provide next steps, a professional opinion, answer questions, and provide reassurance when needed is a vital part of being with women. As we know, this is the meaning of the word midwife. It was such a pleasure chatting with all of you um, during my segment on this topic. Emily will now follow me with another exciting alternative therapy to consider. Happy International Day of the Midwife. Next slide. Hi, everyone. My name's Emily, and I'm really thrilled to be here today. Thank you, Joe. That was amazing. I currently reside in sunny San Diego, and I embarked on my journey originally as a medical oncology nurse, field that provided deep fulfillment, and I'll never forget. My heart, however, has always been drawn to women's care and the transformative world of childbirth. So in addition to my credentials as a nurse, I'm also a certified vinyasa yoga teacher. This discipline has inspired me to integrate the calming and strengthening aspects of yoga into a more comprehensive care approach. I firmly believe in the holistic approach to healthcare where mental, physical, and emotional wellness are not just beneficial, but essential for positive childbirth and life. <laughs> um, like Joe, I'm really excited to be graduating on May 17th. I am gonna be graduating as a CNM and WHNP student, and I'm so excited to take boards and serve my community. So thank you for having me today. And um, next slide. I'm sorry, I'm just getting a pop up. I'm asking what language I am speaking. I'm speaking in English today. I hope it's coming off as English and not translated. Um, so it is a beautiful thing celebrating together this day across the globe, and I'm so grateful for the chance to be surrounded by all of you professionals from various regions. It's so clear that cultures around the world have different practices of managing the discomforts of labor. For example, indigenous communities have distinct birthing practices rooted deeply in cultural traditions involving rituals, chants, medicinal plants, whereas Western cultures there's a heavy reliance on medical interventions such as epidurals, IV pain meds, nitrous oxide. Um, however, there are alternative methods becoming a little more popular, which is exciting, like water birthing, acupuncture, and hypnobirthing. These diverse cultural approaches reflect not only traditional beliefs and practices, but also the influence of globalization, which has led to a blending and adoption of various pain management techniques across different societies. The availability of medical resources and individual preferences within each culture clearly contributes to a wide range of experience in labor pain management. And I just wanted to take a second to ask everyone if they want to contribute in the chat. Um, what approaches to pain management do you currently use? to manage your patient's labors or have you seen used? 
And next slide. So now I just wanna cover a brief review of the physiology of pain in labor. So during the initial phase of labor, the pain experienced by the birthing person is typically caused by the stretching of the lower segment of the uterus and widening of the cervix, compounded by the buildup of acid in uterine muscles due to the continuous contractions. This physical process triggers a complex hormonal response, primarily driven by the sympathetic nervous system. Multiple hormones, catecholamines, cortisol, cytokines are released, leading to various physiological changes. And if pain during labor is not adequately managed, it can lead to heightened anxiety and fear. This emotional stress activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access even further, exacerbating the release of catecholamines and cytokines, intensifying the body's stress response, basically a perfect stress storm feedback. Um, on the other side, we have oxytocin, which we all love and know as the love hormone, um, functions as a neurotransmitter within the parasympathetic nervous system, playing a vital role to mitigate the stress response, helping to lower cortisol and support recovery from stress. And I'd just like to highlight that neural networks in the brain integrate sensory input, emotions, cognitive states, past experiences, past trauma, and cultural social contexts. A woman's experience of labor is influenced by her expectations, anxiety levels, previous experience, support systems, and birthing environment. Pain management strategies during labor clearly need not to only address the birthing person's physical pain, but consider her emotional well-being. Thank you. Next slide. And now on to the exciting topic that I have chosen to present today is hypnobirthing. So if you know it, great. If you don't, welcome. Um, so hypnobirthing is a childbirth method that combines techniques such as deep breathing, relaxation, light touch, visual, visualization, meditative practices, all to help manage and reduce pain and stress during the stages of labor. Hypnobirthing can be used solely by the birthing person or by the birthing person and their main support partner to help them maintain the state of mind throughout the laboring process. This approach aims to provide a more serene and controlled birthing experience by empowering the mother to feel physically, mentally, and emo emotionally prepared. Hypnobirthing emphasizes changing a person's inner dialogue to alter their pain experience and prevent tension. For example, the birthing person might use affirmations like, I am strong, I am capable, my baby and I are working together, I will meet my baby soon. Some of you may have used this in your practice without even calling it hypnobirthing, but this is all under the blanket term. And hypnosis is described as a relaxing and natural state of the body. It is driven by the individual, characterized by awareness and control and relaxation. And no matter the type of birth, hypnobirthing is meant to serve the laboring mother to achieve a calm, controlled state. Labor in itself, as we know, can often be called the birthing bubble. And hypnobirthing aims to give the birthing person the chance to have a more focused, calm labor and better birth experience by minimizing stress. It gives the mother a chance to learn about the physiology of birth in the hormonal process as she trains with this throughout her pregnancy leading up to labor. It's often taught in classes or workshops. It can be supplemented with audio recordings, reading materials like Make Your Birth Better, which is a book on Amazon. There are hypnobirthing podcasts on smartphones. It is becoming very prevalent and in many different forms. And while it doesn't guarantee a completely pain-free labor and birth, many who use hypnobirthing techniques report having a more controlled birth experience with less focus on pain overall. Next slide, please. So right now I'll just talk about hypnobirthing and pain relief. So hypnobirthing's impact on the pain process during labor is rooted in its influence on both the physiological and psychological aspects of childbirth. And this chart is a brief breakdown. So the techniques of hypnobirthing promote deep relaxation which can help reduce the body's stress response. 
And this also decreases hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, which ultimately intensify the pain perception. A relaxation and controlled breathing practice in hypnobirthing can lead to the release of endorphins, body's natural painkillers, and overall providing a sense of well-being and reduced pain perception. The increased oxygen flow from rhythmic breathing of hypnobirthing increases O2 to the mother and the baby, which ultimately reduces pain and improves the efficiency of contractions. Hypnobirthing emphasizes the power of the mind over the body, and by focusing on this, it can lead to less tension and making labor more manageable, having a mental shift that alters the way that pain is perceived. Hypnobirthing aims to reduce fear and anxiety, thereby reducing overall body tension and perception of pain. So by combining these physiological and psychological strategies, hypnobirthing aims to create a more comfortable and controlled labor and birth experience, having a positive birth being the ultimate goal for the mother. Next slide, please. So I had the pleasure, like Joe, of doing some in-depth literature reviews of recent studies. And I found a few very positive studies analyzing hypnotechniques across the world. In the first study, a randomized control study, 80 milliparous pregnant patients were divided into two groups, experimental and control, in a maternity hospital. The couples in the experimental group received hypnobirth training in groups leading up to birth. Fear of childbirth was assessed, birth pain was assessed, and birth satisfaction was assessed. And the findings showed that women who received hypnobirth training received fewer analgesics and less inductions. While almost all the pregnancies of the women in the experimental group resulted in vaginal delivery, more than half of the women in the control group gave birth by cesarean section. And the women that received hypnobirth training also breastfed their babies within the first 30 minutes recommended by the WHO, and they made skin-to-skin -skin contact within the first minute of birth. In the control group, the time until breastfeeding and skin-to-skin, -skin, unfortunately, was above this recommended time. And in the second study listed, a qualitative study analyzing individual experiences with hypnobirthing, there were also quite a few positive findings. The women reported that the knowledge they gained in the classes of hypnobirthing led to new perspectives and changed their view of childbirth. The women reported developing a new holistic perspective where they considered pregnancy and childbirth a natural state of the female body and not a panicked medical event of life. This increased their confidence in their own ability to give birth and they gained new insight into their inherent resources and through active participation, they developed ownership of their childbirth. Overall, the women found that as a result of hypnobirthing technique classes, their experience of labor changed from being a potentially risky event to more of an existential, meaningful experience, which is just beautiful. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to take a moment now to ask in what ways everyone thinks that healthcare systems can integrate hypnobirthing into standard maternity care practices and any barriers they might see. And while you're chatting, I'm just gonna add, um, so healthcare providers can be trained in hypnobirthing techniques, ensuring that they can competently teach and support other staff as they support and teach these methods to expectant mothers. Hospitals and clinics can incorporate hypnobirthing into their existing prenatal classes, offering it as an option alongside their childbirth prep methods. Encouraging expectant mothers to include hypnobirthing techniques in their birth plans can promote personal choice and tailored childbirth experiences on their own time as they go through meditative practices on their own schedule during their pregnancy. Next slide, please. So I just wanna go over a few takeaways and thank you for today. Hypnobirthing is accessible, it's affordable requiring no physical medical equipment and intense training, it has the potential to make a profound global impact on labor and birth experiences, care experiences, and life experiences. By lowering financial barriers and promoting a method known for enhancing maternal comfort and reducing stress, 
it can significantly improve outcomes worldwide for childbirth. This approach not only supports mother during a crucial time, but also aligns with the broader public health goal of increasing safety and satisfaction of birth experiences globally. As midwives and future midwives like myself, we have the unique opportunity to bridge the gap between traditional methods and holistic methods like hypnobirthing. And by actively discussing its benefits, showcasing evidence-based outcomes, and sharing positive patient stories, we can help reduce skepticism within the medical community and foster a more inclusive understanding of the diverse ways to support women in their birth experiences with practices like moxibustion, like hypnobirthing. I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you so much and happy International Day of the Midwife.